here's a case. A 66-year-old woman presents with clinical stage 2 lung adenocarcinoma with a biopsied primary right upper lobe, 4.5 centimeter mass. She had some enlarged right hilar adenopathy. These were PET avid, but no distance spread on PET scan. Uh, she had an endobarchial ultrasound, no evidence of mediastinal involvement. So let's start with one question. What biomarker testing do you favor at this time, if any? Uh, Justin, your thoughts? Yeah, th this is in evolution right now. I mean, it, literally on Friday, I had a meeting with our molecular pathologist uh, as well as our, our anatomic pathologist, medical oncologist, et cetera. To, to help define this. And, and I think that's been informed by, you know, some of the, the latest neoadjuvant data. Um, for us, you know, the, the oncologist in me, you know, where I want all the information, ideally I'd want, I'd want pd one I'd want complete molecular genotyping, you know, uh, but admittedly, you know, if you pressed me, you know, how much would I use that molecular genotyping at, you know, my initial decision-making, you know, it, it's much more limited. And so we run into issues with payers, um, you know, genotyping earlier stage lung cancers. I think in light of the Checkmate A16 data though, where, where patients with EGFR and ALK who were excluded from that trial and therefore that paradigm, I think that that does put uh, molecular genotyping more in the forefront of earlier stage disease. And so we are now as of Friday starting to genotype our, our early stage patients um, if they are candidates for, for neoadjuvant therapy. So we're getting both PDL1 and a rapid NGS platform. So NGS and PDL1 at your side. Anna, your, your approach, and I guess it's sort of a balance between the quantity of information that you want, but also a, a little bit of turnaround time has to factor in as well, right? Definitely. And that was going to be my other comment. I think for PDL1, we have less pressure in terms of time, which usually it's a lot easier to get in terms of test. But when we come down to what are the other molecular biomarkers, do we really, do we need complete sequencing of the tumor, which would have a two, three, four week turnaround, depending on platform and hospital that is available versus should we go back to the testing that all of us as oncologists, I don't think anymore, try to do in piecemealing, getting specific EDFR or ALK um, that would maybe potentially be faster and at the same time, less costly from a payer standpoint and really is the information that we would use at this point in the, in the um, making decisions. The other part um, I think that is important is thinking, do we have access to clinical trials in which we would use that NGS testing and information um, on the neoadjuvant setting for this patient potentially. For example, at my institution we do, and that has helped us move towards pushing a lot more for early biomarker testing. And the other part is how much tissue do we have um, in this stage and should we use it all um, for trying to get this information? Is it gonna be sufficient? Um, do we believe, for example, that the negative in the bronchial biopsies at that point were accurate or is there suspicion of higher stage which would potentially make us think differently and push more for biomarker testing. I think all of those are also things to take into account. So great point there. Sometimes if it's EBUS, we might not have a whole lot of tissue. We'll have to be a little selective. I think an important point is while in the stage four setting, I think all of us are big proponents of full next-gen sequencing and these big comprehensive panels, uh, I think that we're still establishing our workflow in the front and it wouldn't be out of line to order PCR and FISH for a smaller panel in this setting. So we have to, to, to think of the context of our testing a little differently here and make sure we don't get confused. Now, let's say in this, in this particular case where we have a four and a half centimeter tumor, suspicious hilar nodes, but uh, no biopsy proven adenopathy, uh, here we get biomarker testing one way or another. Let's say we find no driver mutations and our pdl one expression is low at 8%. And so what approach do you recommend at your center? We're thinking just broadly preoperative versus postoperative systemic therapy or, or both. Maybe I'll start with you this time, Anna. I think um, one is how... What our surgery change, um, whether you do pre-op versus post-op um, 
um, chemotherapy at this at this stage would be one consideration. The other one, at least with a lot of discussions in our, this is a case that I would definitely bring to tumor board and engage with our surgeons in defining one type of surgery that they would address. Is this a central or peripheral tumor? Is another thing that they definitely quote and take into account. Um, and in this particular stage, I would probably go straight to surgery and then do post-operative um, adjuvant therapy, primarily because of the unknown nodal involvement. Um, if I had a couple of prior imaging in which the lymph nodes were enlarged and those are stable over time, you could potentially think, is this not going to be um, nodal disease related to cancer or some other um, you know, chronic illness that is driving that. But with this question mark, I would want to have a full staging, at least surgically, to then drive my adjuvant treatment. Justin, any thoughts on your side? It's a good question. And, you know, I, I think the point of mediastinal staging is a good one. Um, I think this is usually would be a case where our thoracic surgeons would, would be doing the EBUS. And if there was concern, they, they'd actually follow it up with the mediastinoscopy at, at the same time preoperatively. Um, and so we'd have that information. And I think in the setting of a negative PET, negative EBUS, negative mediastinoscopy, that, that's as good as you can get um, in terms of your, your therapeutic decision-making. Um, you know, I think there are arguments for neoadjuvant approaches here. Um, I think the neoadjuvant platform offers uh, a few advantages to adjuvant. Um, one it is based on preclinical models. It, it looks like having the tumor in situ actually leads to a more diverse uh, immune response, um, just, just having more antigen present as opposed to an adjuvant paradigm. So in my, my mind, that, that's one big plus for neoadjuvant approaches. I also think it, it can be a paradigm for drug development, uh, biomarker discovery, things like that. But, but ultimately, those, those are secondary. You know, the, the, the main point is going to be, what do we think is going to provide a more robust uh, response? And in this patient with, with lower pd one expression, um, you know, I feel better about giving neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy rather than you know, just relying on sequential chemo followed by immunotherapy, um, given the low PDL one expression. Yeah, I think that uh, these these are great points. And while you're right, the the neoadjuvant approach allows you to deliver IO. One could also argue that in that group, they didn't seem to derive as much benefit um, from the IO either. Um, and, and I think we have a lot of reasonable options in this particular case. The patient with clinically a stage two non-small cell lung cancer went to surgery first. And while I think that I agree with, with both of you that there are potential advantages to initial systemic therapy, uh, I still think that most people probably would go to surgery um, up front, at least in the community practices, um, certainly not an unreasonable approach. And so upfront surgery performed. However, in this case, there were three of five mediastinal nodes that were involved. These are four R nodes. Um, and so uh, N2 adenopathy, uh, unsuspected microscopic disease, PDL one again, 8%. So what do you recommend here? And maybe a, a, a pointed question, uh, Justin, radiation, any role here for microscopic N2 at your institution? So I think it warrants uh, a, at least a meeting with the radiation oncologist. We, we, we see these patients in a multidisciplinary clinic. I think the, the kind of uh, short answer is, you know, currently there's really not a role for port um, in the management of surgically resected stage three disease uh, based upon the lung art data. Um, but I think it's worth a conversation, you know, if patients have, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're worried about gross residual disease, you know, th those are cases where, um, you know, I think there's more of a conversation, but for this particular patient, I don't think there's a role for port here. And what about at your institution, Anna? I agree. I think in our institution also, we would probably have a discussion at tumor board regarding if there's any particular role or feeling, but most likely we wouldn't recommend radiation um, in this patient, but we would proceed with systemic therapy. 
you know, the same, same at our institution. And I have to say that the, you know, while we debate about the different approaches for us at, at our institution, lung art was immediately practice changing. And, you know, we had used post-operative radiotherapy for years, but based on fairly weak evidence with a lot of potential selection bias and that prospective study that really failed to show a survival benefit, caveats aside with the radiation approach, it really put, I think, the burden of proof on, on showing that there was benefit. So that immediately changed practice for us. We would not offer radiation in the absence of, of positive margins. And for us, we would recommend, you know, uh, with nodal involvement, adjuvant, cisplatin-based chemotherapy. Uh, and then for PDL one low, I'll, I'll start. On our institution, we, we do recommend atezolizumab. We do give it. That is the FDA approved. I acknowledge that in the PDL one low group, there was sort of a less impressive hazard ratio. And we know that our colleagues in Europe generally reserve adjuvant immunotherapy for the PDL one high subgroup. Uh, last question in this case for both of your groups, PDL one low, are you favoring the use of adjuvant checkpoint inhibitors? Uh, Anna, is this something that, that you guys routinely recommend? Yes, we are similar to you, um, at, you know, explaining and taking into account that in that setting, yes, the data is less strong and questionable whether there is a lot of impact um, or improvement in DFS. I do think, though, with N2 disease um, in surgery, you also have the argument of potentially adding um, better improvement when you have the PDL1 um, in a test. So, for this particular case. So we do recommend it, chemotherapy and immunotherapy, unless there are reasons why the patient should not be getting immunotherapy as prior history of other comorbidities. And uh, Justin, your institution, assuming there were no drivers on NGS, pdl one low here, what's your recommendation? Yeah, so, so definitely chemotherapy. Um, you know, I, I would be, I guess, in the minority. I, I, I would probably not give adjuvant PDL1 blockade here. Um, I think, you know, if you compare the, the strength of the data, neoadjuvant versus adjuvant in this patient population, the neoadjuvant data is much stronger, right? There, there was a, a, a difference in path CR rate, and the hazard ratio was 0.58. Um, in the one to 49% with neoadjuvant. Um, and, you know, it was a much smaller sample size. You know, in, in Empower 010, you know, the adjuvant to tezolizumab, I think there, you know, it was more like 0.86 in, in that group. And it really looked like it was driven entirely by the 50% or above. That said, you know, it's FDA approved um, in, in that context. I have a conversation with the patient. We go over the, the pros, cons. I don't think I can be dogmatic about it, but I, I, you know, it's not my default recommendation for the high expressors or default for the one to 49. I, I think we also have to be careful with our language, right? You know, the low, what is low, what is high? I, I think here it's the one to 49% group um, and it's not my default recommendation. And I think one question is all of these cutoffs are at the same time arbitrary. So it's really one to 49, the cutoff that we should be seeking for, for what is a low expressor versus using a separate one. We've just used those through trials. Um, but can we really say that somebody that has 49% PDL like one expression versus one will have the same response? I, I don't know that we have actually any data surrounding that either. I also think that philosophically, how much strength do we put in sort of uh, non-primary endpoint subset analyses. And I think that's been a, a real area of difference between the U.S. regulatory authorities and the European regulatory authorities. And, and hard to know exactly who's right. I think there's no question that the benefit is stronger in the PDL one high. And I agree the numbers, even though not significant and the confidence intervals are pretty wide, um, it did look better for PDL one low in the neoadjuvant setting. Um, in the adjuvant setting, I think the hazard ratio was, was 0.87. But if you take out the EGFR and ALK, it drops down to sort of the low 0.8s, and we've certainly changed practice for less impact before, right? Um, so I think that uh, what we'll also be waiting to see is its impact on survival, and hopefully we won't have to wait too long for some of those results. But uh, I think that there are a lot of reasonable options. Clearly, we would discuss this with the patient going forward. I think we agreed on the chemotherapy in this setting, and then the immunotherapy would take a bit of a conversation. So interesting case, I think one that we have seen already and we'll continue to see uh, in, in the very near future.